Hi, everybody. Welcome to Conversations with Calvin, We the Species. Chronologically, we're uh, at the end of April. Uh, and uh, this is hugely special for me because I have this great affinity for Gen Z. Uh, and I have a quintessential member of Gen Z that we're going to spend some time with now, Ethan Herrera uh, from Ohio, live from Ohio. Uh, and and uh, we have to pay homage, uh, Ethan and I, to Yashi S., who is a Rutgers Honor student, whom I met and, and I had done some uh, climate and One Health work with in, in a panel and, and, and not too long ago, Yashi suggested, because she had worked with you, we can talk about her briefly uh, in, in a minute, but um, uh, she suggested I, I check out uh, Ethan Herrera and, and contact him, and, and I took a look, and, and um, I'm going to pay a huge compliment uh, to you, Ethan, and I said this before we went on air, uh, your persona, your accomplishments, what you've done, where you're going, bespeaks somebody in their 40s or 50s not in their 20s. So that's a huge, huge compliment of achievement. And in your short time, your couple of decades here, uh, you've accomplished and achieved and, and uh, you've grown and you've been uh, on quite a journey uh, and you've achieved. And uh, it's a remarkable journey. I, I just spent some time before we went on air uh, watching some of your videos. I did watch if you want to talk about it later, I, I did watch, I mentioned to you, I think last week, uh, The Dreaded uh, Spoonful. Yes. I did watch that. It was a short film that you made, you wrote and directed. Uh, I actually started to read the, the screenplay, but uh, I, um, anyway. Uh, so uh, it, it's a huge honor for me. Uh, um, and I, I take these honors um, very carefully. To, to be able to spend some time with you now. Uh, and again, I, I marvel at your journey and what you've achieved. And we're going to unpack that. The official title uh, for, for everybody watching, uh, Ethan Herrera, Gen Z Activist Truth Initiative, uh, which we have a lot to talk about. I didn't know what it was until I met Ethan. Uh, he's a filmmaker and he's in the process now of walking across Ohio as a fundraiser. We'll talk about that too. Uh, so, uh, I, I can't thank you enough for being here. Uh, Calvin, thank you for having me. And, and why don't you do a little bit of a, a bio and, and, and uh, an intro, and then we'll jump into uh, some things that make you tick. Sure thing. I'll keep it short. Um, I'm Ethan, born in Northeast Ohio, been here for most of my life. And uh, for the past couple of years, I've been into activism, into mental health been working with uh, nonprofits such as Hand Sandy Hook and Truth Initiative. And today I'm now an ambassador of Truth Initiative. Perfect. Um, uh, let's kind of unpack some things in your life. Um, and I had asked you if you wanted to talk about this stuff before we went on air um, and, and um, your game, so, so I'm game. Somewhere in the, in the vicinity of 2018, uh, with your parents uh, having separated, you went through uh, issues of mental health uh, as a result of that. Why don't you say a few words about that? All right. Yeah, my parents separated back in 2012. I was 10 years old at the time, and I was having to deal with trying to fix other people as well when I was younger. And it got to a point where I went to pediatrics uh, once when I was 11 and twice when I was 16. Uh, after that, I mean, now I'm, now I'm good. But back then it was uh, really conflicting because things started taking a turn and getting faster and faster when, when uh, the Parkland shooting happened back in February 2018. Uh, not even a week after that, there was another shooting that happened at my middle school. And I was in sophomore year when that had occurred. And that's when both my personal life, my family life, and, you know, the world around me just started to kind of blend together and, and almost brought me to, to ruin. Wow. Wow. So you went from that, um, and trying to find out who you were, uh, uh, and, and then you 
got the help that you needed. And, and uh, then in 2020, uh, you actually ran for student council president mm -hmm. and you won. Can you talk about, it? by the way, I watched your, uh, your, um, your video. Uh, I, th I thought it was great. It's, it's like I'm watching a, it's like I'm watching, uh, you know, a candidate running for like Senator of Ohio. Uh, you had a, a great video, which people can find. By the way, all your videos and all your information, all the links are going to be here and on the promo pieces. But, you know, I watched that uh, that campaign video that you made a couple of years ago, and it was great. And you won. You want to talk about that campaign and stuff? Yeah. Yeah, so that happens right after I healed. I went to pediatrics again after 2018, got healed. 2019 was just a whole year of healing, a whole year of processing, uh, just, just kind of, you know, staying away from the public eye. 2020 was actually the beginning of my almost fully healed period to the point where I was operating as a human being again, and I loved doing stuff, and I was joyous. And that was right before the pandemic happened, right? I wanted to run as early as September, I believe, of 2019 for, for my senior year, because I just had a big fascination in politics, a big fascination in wanting to represent people, uh, especially healing and finally being able to express, express myself in my own way instead of like a, a, a inaccurate alter ego. I felt that I could represent people a little bit better with my mental health. So I ran but then the pandemic happened and we had to do everything digitally. I, elections were postponed and then they said they, they could only do it uh, digitally through email. Mm -hmm. And, you know, elections, you know, in the, in the movies, it's, you know, passing out buttons and having all these posters up. To a degree, it was like that in my high school, but now we had to do everything digitally, make sure that we told everybody on the internet, which was difficult. So what I did in order to win, which eventually got, you know, not a landslide victory, but enough to where I could win against the popular kids that were running at the time, was to make that video that Calvin was mentioning, that, that you were referencing, that I said to my team, I had a campaign team, I said, hey, I'm going to do this. This might be the final nail in the, uh, in the not in the coffin, but to run and to win. I said, I'm going to do this last thing, and we're going to see how it goes a week prior to the elections ending. So I made that video. And 24 hours afterwards, when I was on my Snapchat story and my Instagram, people were actually downloading that video and reposting wow. it to their own story. So they really liked what I was doing. And I, I saw my face for a day or two just through my Snapchat stories. Like half of them were just me, people posting that video. So and that eventually led to me me winning the election afterwards. Uh, my team and all celebrated that and uh that was that was where I started to not only heal for myself, but also represent other people and start to have this mission of of representing uh, the the generation that I'm in now and the mental health that we face. Wow, wow. very impressive, and, and folks should watch that. Um, uh, and, and you know your platform, mental health, and, and stuff like that. Uh, I don't have to say. It's it's national news uh, every day. There's a shooting, and this is your generation is growing up with that. Uh, every day, there's a shooting. Um, it, it's uh, it's incomprehensible to me. I I can't fathom, uh, and and I I can't even imagine. I you know I have grandchildren, and they're gonna go through that 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 world that that's not changing it's getting it seems like it's being more exacerbated you know the more media covers the more things happen and, and I, I don't know the the numbers twelve thousand people were shot already this year it, it's, it's something incomprehensible uh but you're very brave um uh uh and and you know you look in the mirror look what you've achieved it's great stuff you're really we're going to talk about that also um let's talk about your involvement uh in sandy hook promise and, and i know lots of us people know about sandy hook promise um talk about that how you got involved 
and and um you're really committed to that and we'll mm. talk about that too Pick all right up. march of 2021 this was towards the this was a month or two before i graduated i was still president and we have this thing called see something say something week at our school which was instated after the parkland shooting and what had happened in our communities Every week we would have something that we do like Monday, we would go and, you know, make uh, letters of gratitude or something like that. Tuesday would be going to sit with someone, you know, at lunch that was alone by themselves. Wednesday, you know, that sort of thing. Example, example. Uh, the problem was, was that it was instated by the school, but there was no obligation for any students to do any of it. And they weren't doing it. Students were finding it to be just a blanket thing. Yeah. That, in my opinion, the school did to look good for other parents to say, oh, OK, they're doing something about mental health. It wasn't that the school was being you know, bad about it or being uh, you know, deliberate and not helping. It was just that they couldn't really reach the students. What I like to say is that students and teachers, they have the same language, but they have a different dialect. If you're not from around here and you're trying to explain a really deep concept or trying to relate to somebody, that dialect is gonna get in the way. That's just how people work. Uh, and I use that metaphorically for generations, right? So what I decided to do, seeing this happen multiple times and me being frustrated, is make a video about my mental health story, you know, the stuff in 2018 that I went through, uh, you know, going through pediatrics and, you know, I was a different person. I put that all out there. I just I just put it all into a video and I uploaded it. I worked with my principal and my counselor to make that video. And it was when it was put up, a lot of people loved it. A lot of people just had a different reaction to it than what was done before because mm -hmm. nobody had really, no student has ever done something like that. People were coming up to me, you know, in school asking me about stuff. People were going to, you know, counseling after that video just because it was a different change of pace. Uh, people were writing letters to me, like uh, teachers and parents. And that's when I knew I was like, oh my gosh, that's, you know, I'm doing something a little bit different, something good. Uh, and then Sandy Hook, a couple months later, found out about that, reached out. And now the video is uploaded on their channel. Wow. Wow. What an accomplishment. Really. What an amazing accomplishment. And um, the next segue. And this is an important segue. You're you're so involved um, in in the Truth Initiative. Uh, I didn't know what that was until I, I met you. Um, uh, anti tobacco vaping. Uh, we talked about this briefly before we went on air. I, I mentioned uh, uh, philosophically, you know, some of the the bad things about our species. Uh, one is greed. Uh, 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 number one is, is greed and power and, and tobacco companies know they don't have something that's helpful yet it's mm -hmm. all money um, so let's talk about what Truth Initiative is your involvement uh, how you got involved um, take it away all Right. so Truth Initiative is a, is a non-profit it came out of the 1999 Master Settlement Agreement which was half, half a dozen or so of the uh, tobacco CEOs that had said that their products were not addictive. Courts found out that it, it, it concluded that it was. So they paid about, uh, I'm not gonna get the numbers correct, but they paid hundreds of millions of dollars uh, in result. And that money then went into the Legacy Foundation, which later was renamed the Truth Initiative. And the Truth Initiative is now one of the largest nonprofits that uses their funds and resources to advocate uh, originally back then for cigarettes, but now for vaping and nicotine products as well. And I originally got involved with them because of a scholarship opportunity that they have given. So this would have been December of 2021 is when I applied for it. Didn't get accepted, but I made a great video that they liked and said, you know, you didn't get the 5,000 it was for the scholarship, but we like what you do. We're going to keep in touch. 
couple months later in April, I was in Washington, D.C. with them for Moment of Action, which is equivalent to like their Christmas, uh, where we went to the National Mall and we had advocated, made some noise, that sort of thing. Uh, just a couple of days ago, too, uh, again, it's like the uh, end of April, give or take. I went for the second Moment of Action uh, just not, not too long ago. And I really like working with them, uh, the great people. You know, being around the top five people that you're surrounded by, that quote is amazing. I mean, Calvin, I know you probably know it as well with your years in journalism. Uh, whoever you're surrounded by, you, you, you become a different person. And these people are crazy. They're insane, but they want to do different things in the world that not a lot of people uh, even, even, even fathom for one reason or another. You know, it's interesting. I'm listening to you, uh, you know, tobacco and all this. Not not necessarily dramatically off topic, but in, in the work I've done uh, with climate change and, and, and oceans and microplastics, you know, there's a huge problem of cigarette butts uh, winding up in the ocean and, and those plastic, you know, the plastic filters wind up in the ocean. And and you know there are billions of, of of cigarette butts floating around there uh, and in landfills, et cetera. But problem problem is, uh, uh, you know, the fish eventually get to eat that. I don't know if you ever thought about this, but the fish get to eat that, um, and and we eat fish, so we the species are ingesting. In part, some of you know plastic bottles are in the ocean as well, but uh, uh, we are eating because we eat fish and fish eat those cigarette butts. Uh, uh, we are eating the equivalent of uh, almost a, a credit card worth of plastic every month. Uh, uh, and part of that, what we're consuming uh, is cigarette butts. I don't know if you ever heard this story but uh it, it's real uh and, and it came from uh, actually a researcher that i had interviewed um scary stuff uh and 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 actually a month or two ago uh scientists found the first traces of and the plastics are in our body and again cigarette companies are are in part to blame for that uh but they they found uh a couple of months ago the first traces of plastic in in mother's breast milk, mm. scary stuff. So the Truth Initiative uh, is a wonderful thing. Uh, we just need to get that product, you know, you know, out of circulation. So you're doing great stuff with that. Um, uh, a little deep breath here. I, I want to just go off topic for one sure. second. Um, I. I kind of forewarned you I was going to do this. Uh, I have a favorite question uh, I'd like to ask. Um, uh, you don't have you don't have to answer it. it it's a one word uh, answer, but it's kind of fun. So here goes. And if there's more than one answer, that, that, that works too. There's no rules here. So excluding family or friends, somebody living or dead you'd like to spend a day with. The only one that comes to mind, I have many, many role models, people that, that I've learned from, but one of them I have to say is Daryl Davis. Okay. I would say Daryl Davis. Okay, perfect. Perfect, perfect, perfect. Good question. It kind of makes you think. Um, I did watch, uh, and I guess this has something to do with see something, say something. Uh, I forget, but uh, you did um, you did a, a wonderful interview with... Uh, uh, Massillon Mayor Perry, can you talk about that briefly? Yes. So Massillon uh, Mayor uh, Kathy Catazzaro Perry reached out to me or I, part of her team reached out to me in June of 2021, right after I graduated. And they said they wanted to talk about the See Something, Say Something video uh, after Sandy Hook Promise had, had released it. And I said, yeah, definitely. So we went on Massillon Cable TV. And I was interviewed for what my life story was. They played the video 
And it was a, it was a life changing moment because it's the first time, first serious time that I've been on television to talk about, you know, my experience. Um, I learned a lot from that, from that whole situation. You know, you, you, all these things you're doing, you know, becomes part of this great resume and the experience you're getting. So the journeys and the pathways and the roads that you're going to be taking, uh, they're all going to be aided by what you have accomplished and what you're doing, um, which is a, a good segue now. Um, you're now planning, and I believe you're in, in training, for you're going to do a walk across Ohio. So can you talk about how that came about, the training mm -hmm. that you're going through, and the, the funding that you're trying to raise money where that's going to go to? All right. So probably about a year ago, I came up with the idea of wanting to walk across the state of Ohio. Uh, at first, it was for college fund because I was planning on going to a uh, four year public after transferring from a two year community. And I realized that wasn't the move. That wasn't something that I wanted to do. So instead, I decided to go for for charity benefit because I still wanted to say, hey, I walked 250 miles across the state. It's just an awesome, awesome thing to have a conversation about. Uh, and a couple months later, now it's turning a little bit more serious. Uh, I've walked four hour days. I've walked 12 miles just to train for this whole whole occasion. Uh, it's going to be as of right now. It's set for May 15th. It is going to span across 18 days. So about three weeks if I include a couple of days where I rest from it. Um, it's it's a lot of work. I'll tell you that I'm going to the gym, I'm walking a lot, and then I also have to pair that up with school. Uh, so it's it's quite a bit. My goal right now is I'm going to donate to Sandy Hook Promise uh, through through them because I've worked with them before and they're really awesome people. Uh, I'm going to be trying to go for two thousand five hundred bucks because I'm walking about two hundred fifty miles, a dollar per tenth of a mile. My ideal is about five thousand. I want to get to to about five thousand bucks. Uh, for them, but twenty five hundred is my is my minimum that I want to go for. That's great, and you you got to keep me uh, with all the information because I'll promote it and the work. You know, uh, we'll talk about that uh, off air. It's a good thought. Um, Thank you. Um, you you had a couple quotes that I I picked up on uh, that I thought were interesting. If you want to talk about that that uh, the quotes, uh, one quote. Uh, that I picked out was pain makes you stronger. Explain. So there's the common phrase, uh, you know, sticks and stones won't break my bones. Words will never hurt me. Uh, obviously not a true statement. We all know this. But what I like to frame it as is when I say pain makes you stronger, I would, the, the best way I would translate what I meant by that is to be weak and show vulnerability is actually a strong trait while trying to look strong and be strong uh, is actually a sign of weakness with what you do. Pain makes you stronger, gives you strength to be able to show vulnerabilities to the world, which looks like weakness, but is actually a strength. And I show my vulnerabilities and, and in turn, it shows my humanity. You know, some people that work in business or politicians or pe people just generally people that are in the public eye don't want to show that weakness so then we see you know mm -hmm. strong traits leadership traits and sometimes that doesn't translate well because we can we can sense when people are covering up for weakness so i try to do the opposite because it's just how people are it's authentic okay um pretty profound um you had another quote, believe in yourself. I mean, that that's kind of wide open, but what does that mean to you? I think I said that in the Sandy Hook video, um, believe in yourself. I mean, it's such, a, it's such a loaded thing. The world is full of, full of nuance. So I really can't, I really can't say what it means to believe in yourself. A lot of subjectivity when it comes to that. Um, what I would say to that is, is that even if you're in a bad place, even if you're in a place where you know, you're on the verge of just, you know, depression or suicidal. 
I was there a couple of years ago. You know, it's a sense of it's a sense of your environment. It's a sense of your identity. And to believe in yourself is to want to take those those directions that'll that'll bring you towards a better you. For everybody, it's different on what they yeah, want to be sure. in terms of better. But I like to think of it as a healthier, both mentally and physically. You're so um, uh, way ahead of, you know, you, again, I said this at the beginning, you know, you're, you're it's like I'm, I'm talking to somebody in their 40s or 50s, you know, you're so grounded and you have such a handle and you're just a just a young member of Gen Z. Which is very impressive. Truly. I, I, I try to be. I mean, there's there's unfortunate things that happen in our lives that brings trauma or it brings negative emotion or, you know, places that you never want to be in in your life. But I always like to think of the positives. I always like to think these things that occurred to me, but without them, would I be the way I am? Would I have these sort of positive qualities or this you know, you say I'm, it's like talking to someone in their 40s. Would I have that? You know, I think of it as a as a positive byproduct of some pretty negative negative stuff. It is. So I like to like to think, hey, I wouldn't go back because I don't know how I'd be if I didn't go through it. It is. It is all positive. Uh, I, I, I'm. I again, I, I marvel uh, at your journey and where you're at and where you're going. Um, slightly off topic. Uh, uh, I did watch the dreaded uh, spoonful. It was a short, vi a short film, not a video. It's a short film that you made. You know, want to say a couple words about that? Um, it's kind of heavy. It was a kind of a heavy. Um, it was heavy. You think so? Yeah, I, I do. <laughs> um, yeah, it was a bit uh, on the heavy side. A little bit, a little bit. I meant for it to be a, a more of a comedic film. Actually, okay. the reason why is because there's the for people for the dreaded spoonful for people that 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 don't know what it is, is a film I made. It's about 12, 13 minutes. It was based off of a, a short video on Vine, uh, which was popular a couple years ago, where people would make six second videos. Uh, it was a guy that had gone to a fridge and had said, hey, to his friend, um, he said, hey, could I have some ice cream? His friend said only a spoonful of it. And then it switched back to the friend at the fridge, taking out a really large spoon. So that became a, uh, a very big internet thing at the time. Uh, for many people that are not of my generation that watch that, they probably get a whole different meaning from it, uh, which may, may have been what uh, Calvin's interpretation was because it's very niche. But I made that with some friends when I was in a video production class at Glen Oak High School a little like two-year program they had. Uh, and I was supposed to make a capstone, like one of the best projects. And I wrote that script in about two to three days. It was about 14 pages. I was on three hours of sleep and film, filmed it all, edited it all, and showed it the next day. And a lot of people really liked it. It was more so of a fun film to get an assignment in that I that I liked. Uh, I don't know why I, I don't know why I, I pulled out... Um that it was heavy um and it is a pretty heavy it has a it has a climactic element to it there's a conflict yeah. two friends that are completely you know they have different values one thinks it's a small food spoon while the other one thinks it's a bigger one it's stupid but at the same time i mean it can, it can be definitely that. heavy yeah um, laugh, and laughing you're... and crying you know yeah <laughs> i'm glad you're um and i'm gonna go back and watch it again uh just to um now that I have better insight from you, um, I, I always pull out, uh, it's because who I am, I always pull out heavy elements from, from anything and everything. To me, there's, uh, even in, in, in the funniest comedy, there's something heavy about it. There's a message there. I mean, I'm always looking for messages. I mean, that's, that's who I am. You know, that's... In every joke, there's an inkling of truth. Uh, yeah. Yeah, uh, and 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 that's what I'm always looking for—the serious side of something funny. Um, so, um, I I love to ask this question uh, uh, because you're a member of Gen Z, uh, but your your take on social media. Mm -hmm. I know you uh, when you were going through some issues, you pulled yourself away from social 
social media because you recognized that the the unpositive aspects of social media, but your your take in general on, on social media. Mm -hmm. All right. April of 2022 is when I started getting into, into digital minimalism. Uh, it's the book that I, by the same name, by Cal Newport. He does a lot of other productivity-based stuff. I made another book called Deep Work, which is incredible. But he challenged me to 30 days of using only technology that I have to use my day-to-day -day life. Uh, you know, my cell phone I could use for calling for all that. Uh, texting was was sort of a half and half. It all depends. But stuff like, you know, VR or, uh, you know, the computer, I had to question those things. Video games, Netflix, those things, I just had to cut out because they were not necessary, right? So after that all happened and I went through the 30 days, you know, I was still using the microwave. My, you know, if I had an electric toothbrush, I wouldn't count, that sort of thing. Uh, after the 30 days, I just realized Instagram, YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, Pinterest, Tumblr, whatever you use, we we have this idea in our, in our minds that it's essential. Our, our logistical mind thinks, oh, no, it's absolutely not essential. But I, our primal mind is so used to this, this habit that we think it's essential for us to be a social human being, which makes sense because I'm talking to you through Zoom. People can watch people, you know, do mukbangs on YouTube. It seems like a pseudo uh, social concept. So people like to go to that because it's less less work for what seems to be the same amount of value, right, for, for social interactions. So what I learned from all of that is just the some of the evil that comes with social media, the way the algorithms are set up. Uh, what it did to my life, which was put me on hours of YouTube at a time. Hell, I mean, right now, like yesterday, I put in three to four hours. It's insane. I've obviously gone back to some of my habits because it's it's addictive in a sense, but it's something that I now think, okay, I can do it again. This is easy for me. I have the knowledge. So now I'm just looking into how to make technology more essential and optimize it. I have a light phone now. This right here is a an electronic ink screen uh -huh. that only has the essentials, and you may not oh, see wow. it as well. It's called a light but phone? A light phone, yeah. So it only has about 10 functions. Wow. And uh, yeah, I got it for Christmas, and I've been using it ever since. I rarely use my cell phone now. Wow. But I can't go on the internet with this thing. I can't search up stuff. I can't go on social media. So when I'm out and about, I can't check my email. I have to sit there at the doctor's office or at the gas station in line waiting or, you know, not on my email, but talking to people or thinking to myself. It's been so much better because I feel like there's a piece of me that, that's been on top of me that's just drifted off and it feels awesome. It's worth, I think this right here was 300, which iPhones are about a thousand. So this right, right here is actually a pretty decent market. Um, but I'm optimizing my technology so then it's so much easier to just, yeah, you know, talk and explain. How can I, how else can I explain it? I understand. I understand. Uh, um, you know, it's funny. We um, before we went on air, we uh, I talked about a, an interview that I I did with this um, this college professor he teaches philosophy and we, we're going to do a series of these things his name's josh bashinsky but we we um one of the things i wanted to talk to this philosopher about which sort of ties into the light phone watch how i develop this um i'm listening talk uh, about it yeah uh um uh, uh i i brought up the the question with him uh to discuss the mind of einstein uh, because it, it's fascinated me for years and years and years. As a matter of fact, uh, 15 years ago, I found this picture of Einstein, his eyes. Mm -hmm. And it, it sits behind my computer there. It's been looking at me for 15 years. So, it's a little Orwellian, don't you think? It, yeah, it is. <laughs> it is Orwellian. And, and actually, I don't want to get too heavy here, but uh, I started spiritually communicating with Albert Einstein and I was talking to this 
like I said, he's a genius. He's got a 160 IQ. And, um, uh, and, and I actually was trying to spiritually connect with him uh, and asking for help. And, and, and actually from that moment on, it would appear that my writing had just improved like overnight. Uh, and, and, and so the philosopher said, yeah, uh, that it, it's plausible. It's plausible and, and, and real. Um, uh, but to tie into what you just said, uh, Ethan, uh, uh the, the light phone so how did uh, einstein achieved everything he did achieve here's the point I, sometimes i take a long time to spit a point out the point is he achieved everything he did without google mm -hmm. that's uh, so uh everything he achieved everything he learned he learned from without uh, the only help he had was, you know, Isaac Newton dropped an apple from a tree, something like that. But so there's such validity uh, into quote a light phone, uh, mm -hmm. um, and and uh, and I love the notion of digital minimalism. And, and I okay. took notes on. By the way, I was taking notes on listening to you. So there, I'm taking notes on you. Uh, I want to look that up. I, I think I like that digital yeah. minimalism. I did want to mention with this too and with all my other technology and optimization that the reason why I think Einstein did all he did is because he was an expert at self-inquiry. Now we don't have the, the same benefit as, you know, Einstein did sometimes or other philosophers back then with being left alone in a room for hours in silence at your desk, being able to ponder all of these concepts and, and uh, you know, ideas of life because of the distractions that we have in our world, you know? So with something like this, I mean, I've had so much more, more with journaling, with meditation, you're so much more encouraged to do it because if you don't have a computer near you, if you don't have a cell phone that can, or if you have a flip phone or a dumb phone and all you can do is call a friend or listen to a podcast you've downloaded, there's going to be a point where you're saying I'm bored. And that's perfect because he was bored as he was, he was bored as hell as well, you know? And if, but if he wasn't bored or if Isaac Newton weren't sitting under that tree being bored, we wouldn't have found certain things that if otherwise we would be distracted to even see. Right. So it's all about, it's all about self inquiry. Uh, sometimes I'm point, I'm, I, some things are pointed out to me sometimes when I'm so distracted. Uh, it actually just happened a couple of days ago and this ties in a little bit, is I was in Washington, D.C. I had come out of the uh, the Hart Building, which is an office uh, where a lot of senators are. And I was distracted. I was thinking to myself. I was, you know, just kind of in my little world when one of the other represent, not the other representatives, but one of the other people with Truth Initiative tapped on my shoulder and pointed at somebody. Had I not had that happen, I would have noticed that Senator Cory Booker was walking by getting wow. coffee with a constituent. Wow. And I started laughing. Uh, he's big. He went ran for president back in 2020. He is a, a big senator that's been in his position for quite a while. Had I not noticed, I would have I would have completely missed that. And that was one of the highlights uh, of my day. So it's the self inquiry. It's boredom. All of those things keep you aware. People watching in the mall, people, you know, going to the park and just observing nature, that boredom, I mean, it manifests something beautiful that in the dark ages, back in your time, we they had to deal with, you know. Yes. But now we don't do that too much anymore. Correct. Funny, uh, it is the dark ages. When I, when I grew up, because I'm old, when, when I grew up, our, our only source of knowledge was what was called an encyclopedia. And, I think I heard about that before. <laughs> yeah, it was 20 books. It was called mm -hmm. the World Book Encyclopedia. And there was also another one called Funk and Wagnalls. But there were 20 books. And in those 20 books, you know, like 200 pages a piece, was everything you needed to know in the whole world. Mm. Not true. But that, uh, and that was it. That was your finite world. And, and uh, back when I grew up, 
there were one, two, three, four, five, six. There were seven, and I'm in the New York area, so there were seven black and white TV stations that went on air at seven and went off the air at midnight. And that was my uh, visual world. Um, so, um, you know, and, and then there was a rotary phone. You had a, so it was, it was so, it was so limited. It's funny, you mentioned uh, Senator Booker. Um, I've met him a number uh, of times because hmm. I'm a Jersey guy. And, and um, it's funny, there are a couple of Gen Zs who started a, a company um, uh, to help kids raise money. Uh, they were college students whom, whom I knew and I became friendly with. They started a company to help, uh, it's called Pedal, P-D-U-L, to help kids raise money uh, to go to college, scholarships and stuff. It, it's a really, uh, Kayla and, and, and Chisa, were the, the, but anyway, I, I mentored them and, and helped them and work with them. And, and part of my vision in helping them was to get to Senator Booker here in New Jersey because um, uh, he's a senator and, and he can kind of, and this is right up his alley, you know, to find ways to help kids go to college to, to deal with the exorbitant tuition. But anyway, I, I, again, one of the many times I met him, uh, I, I met him, he was uh, coming to a barbecue and, and I was invited to the barbecue. And, and as he got out of his car, with all the security people, I um, I accosted him and told him what these kids are doing. And uh, four days later, I had these kids in his office down in Newark, New Jersey, uh, talking to his education, uh, the head of his education team. And that's just, that's the responsiveness and the accessibility of Senator Booker. I, I thought that was pretty uh, impressive. And, and again, I've gone on to meet him several times. It's funny that you brought him up. So the last, the last um, question is future think, things that you'd like to do down the road. I was talking to my friend about this last night and I said to him, you know, there's so many ways my life could go. I could be in Austin or in North Carolina working for, I love, I love media. Um, part of my, like, part of the, like the, the angel and the devil or like the multiple mind sort of thing. I believe in that a hundred percent. I love media. I love YouTube, but at the same time, I'm also having a light phone and talking about all these things of how media can be detrimental in today's society. Uh, there's of course, there needs to be a balance. I'm still trying to find that balance. It's a great struggle. But with this, I mean, I want to go into editing. I want to go into filming. I want to be part of the industry with YouTube because it's taking, it's launching off and it's going to be here for quite a while. For the next 10 years, I think it's guaranteed that it will be here and it'll, you know, surpass television even more uh, in, in how, how much people are watching it. So I want to do something like that. I might also work with Truth Initiative uh, for the next couple of years, which will go in a different path. Uh, I could be in the middle of a uh, log cabin in Nebraska you know, I mean, so there's so many places I could be in the next five years that I don't even know what to tell you, Calvin. I mean, it could go many different ways. You know, I want to find some sort of fulfillment and happiness. Uh, you know, fulfillment is the end goal, right? You can have, you can be poor, but you can be fulfilled and you're winning in life compared to the guy that has millions of dollars, but his wife is cheating on him and he has a house that's empty. He's not fulfilled. He's losing, you know? So I, at the end of the day, if I'm fulfilled and I'm, I have a little bit of money to take care of myself and I have people around me that are influential, maybe a dog that's really nice to me, you know, and keeps me company, then so be it, you know, it's all good. Don't have to have too much. No, what a handle, what a handle you have. Um, when I, when I, uh, truly a, a great handle on things. Uh, when I taught at Rutgers, one of the things I taught I taught twice a week. My course was twice a week. It was career explorations, uh, kind of teaching, you know, your generation how to. But one of the things I learned, the factor I learned that your generation will have 17 jobs in your lifetime and five careers. Hmm. That's just the way it is. Um, I mean, I, I look at myself, uh, the couple of careers I had. But after I turned 65, I've had five new careers after 
65, from being a novelist, journalist, a broadcaster, podcaster, a mentor, a lecturer at Rutgers. Um, uh, so you you just go with the flow. You've got your values and your dreams, and, and that's part of the fuel. Uh, but you, you go with that flow, and, and it's a fun journey. Um, and you are uh, a fun, interesting, uh, and we really spent some real great quality time here, Ethan. Uh, and, um, my message uh, to you is, uh, we're friends now, uh, uh, and I'm intrigued. Uh, and so I'm in officially inviting you to come back. I mentioned this beforehand. You can come back. Uh, uh, you can bring friends, do a panel. In other words, this channel, uh, is open. However you want to express yourselves and whatever messages you want to get out there. You know, I'm here and, and and I'm excited to do this. And I can't thank you enough for your graciousness, your time. Uh, and uh, and I marvel at what you're doing. Thank you. Thank you. Yep.